This is, um, today is Wednesday, August 12, 2020. This is a special meeting of the Board of Education. Can we all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. We uh, just came from executive session. We're going to be going back into executive session briefly after this, after this meeting convenes. And uh, this is a pretty short agenda, so we're, we're I mean, it's a special meeting. We're not going to do board comments today. We're just going to get right into it. Um, the main part of this uh, meeting is going to be the superintendent's presentation on the review and opening plan. So we'll just jump right to that. Thank you, everybody. And just give me a second, because I'm going to go to a podium, and I'm going to ask Mr. Chris Keough to help me with the presentation. Good evening, board trustees, community members, and colleagues. Thank you for this opportunity to present again on our plans to reopen Tuckahoe Union Free School District. My thanks, first and foremost, to our dedicated administrators who have been really working around the clock with myself and Mr. Keough and Ms. Lee to get this work done. We are really re redesigning our schools. Our plans contain contributions from also from our collaboration with teachers who gave up their time during the summer vacation and community members whose expertise helped us greatly. Thanks to parents and teachers who asked questions, raised concerns, and helped us through the process. All these groups have shown one thing, their love for their school community. Together, they grounded this plan in what makes Tuckahoe special. It does take a village. As you are aware, we received guidance in July from both the New York State Department of Education and the New York State, and the New York State Department of Health, outlining the different mandated and recommended precautions and protocols we need to put in place. We will detail these in the upcoming slides. We were, were required to submit to the state three plans, one in which we bring all students back on campus, one in which we resume remote learning, and one in which we adopt a hybrid model of the two. Last week, Governor Cuomo announced that we can open schools in New York. We are proud with how successful New York has been in flattening the curve and now we can open the doors to students. In his press conference, he reiterated the importance of working with families and staff. He didn't have to tell us that because we were a district that were already engaging our families and staff in the process early on, inviting community participation in our reopening committees and hosting virtual town halls at various times during the day and the night, even 10 p.m. There was not a question we did not answer or feedback we did not take, and it was extremely helpful to our plan. The same with our meetings with our teachers. We remain open and transparent. Our plan is not a top-down plan. It is the collective voice of the community and our teachers wanting to reboot school safely and give parents the best education for their children and make sure we have continuity for our students and also parent choice. We went, we, in our subcommittees, we met with many experts, doctors, nurses, scientists, operational supervisors, communication directors, and expert educators. Leading the charge was, again, our steering committee of administrators, who, again, are, compl are working now setting up classrooms that meet the needs of your students. 
And we are hammering this out continuously for, again, a safe and effective learning environment. The governor also mandated on Friday that districts post their testing, contact tracing, and remote learning on their websites, independent of their re reopening document. Today, we published three fact sheets, though they are not due until August 22nd, as well as updated our reopening plan over the weekend. You will see in our plan and on our fact sheets the way in which we support these efforts. For example, we have phone numbers and means of communicating with families who may have been exposed. We have also tried in our most recent publication to demystify who is required to quarantine and who is not. In the event of a COVID-19 outbreak, we have an administrative steering committee as well as contact tracers that will work with the Department of Health. We have more on that as we go along with the presentation. And also, we will also talk about how we are cleaning our facilities. As mentioned, we have provided on our website fact sheets on the three areas you see above. In terms of remote learning, we created a separate document highlighting our hybrid model and our remote models. We describe in detail the many ways we are delivering instruction through streaming video, Google Classroom, and other models. We describe the ways students will work and the different programs they will be working throughout the year. For testing, and I mean COVID-19 testing, we identify local testing areas that have been provided by the Westchester County Department of Health. However, for families with individuals who may be presenting with symptoms, this document also presents you to, presents you to local options. In terms of contact tracing, we also released a fact sheet that included new information from the Westchester County Department of Health. We will go through these in the following slides. The Westchester Department of Health issued an FAQ that clarifies questions about contact tracing, and it is now clear that the Westchester Department of Health are primarily responsible for contact tracing, and I mean when somebody comes in contact with somebody with coronavirus, and also for testing to see if they are positive or negative. But they will rely on us for collaboration. This was already in the plan we updated, and we will discuss that in the following slides. They also clarified when in isolation, which means somebody who has coronavirus has to isolate, and quarantine, which is a contact, also has to, in essence, isolate. For example, an individual who, an individual who is positive with COVID-19 must quarantine for 10 days, while an, while an individual who's considered a close contact and that means, and I'll go over this over and over, close being within six feet for more than 10 minutes must quarantine for 14 days. And I will also talk later about proximate contacts. And the difference in the quarantine, which may be confusing to some of you, is due to discrepancies in incubation period. We will be prepared to advise families on all of these topics. And we will also advise families of what happens if there is a positive case in the household. For example, if a sibling is, um, is, is uh, positive for COVID-19, the other sibling would have to stay home. We also have protocols in place for cleaning the schools. And I am saying right now that if we have a positive case in the school, we will be closing, as they say, for at least 24 hours until we see how contact tracing really works most likely we will close for 48 hours as we navigate this process to ensure the health and safety of our community. And again, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but we have this in place. Contact tracing, again, is the process of identifying, notifying, and monitoring anyone who came in close contact with an individual who tested positive for COVID-19 while they were infectious. The, Depart the Department of Health, in conjunction with our district coordinators, will conduct a case investigation. They will trace the people and places the individual may have come in contact with while potentially infectious. While the individual isolates, again, for a minimum of 10 days, contact tracers from Westchester Department of Health will reach out to the individual close contacts to inform them that they were exposed, educate them what to do, 
and provide support as necessary for the situation. And they never tell who the individual is. There is, um, that stays confidential. But on the other hand, we will work with the Department of Health during all aspects of case identification as it pertains to the school district. This information includes the list of close contacts and proximate contacts, and also the location where the individual was. We will be looking at schedules. We will be looking at attendance. And in addition, the Department of Health and we will talk to the individual who is infected. Here's a little chart of when can I return to school. Up on the screen here, you see what it takes for five different individuals to return to school. For an individual who has had close contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19, they may return after a 14-day quarantine period from the last date of contact with the individual. This is because they are considered a close contact. They are within six feet of the individual in an enclosed area. An individual that tests positive for COVID-19 and presents with symptoms may return after at least 10 days have passed since symptom onset, at least three days since the last fever without fever reducing medication, at least three days since symptoms have improved. Please note all these three things are necessary for return to school if an individual tests positive and is presenting symptoms. For an individual who tests positive and does not have symptoms, it is required that at least 10 days pass since the date of the first positive COVID-19 test and the individual has not had any subsequent illness. Meanwhile, an individual documented by health care providers as not diagnosed with COVID-19 may return after there is no fever and they have felt well for 24 hours. If an individual has been diagnosed with another condition and may have written, must have a written note from their health care provider stating they are cleared to re, re, um, return to school. And all of these will be reviewed by our nurse or medical director. Lastly, if an individual returns from a trip from a New York State travel list of a hotspot or international travel, they can only return after completing 14 day quarantine from the date of the return trip. Okay, so person A is diagnosed with a laboratory confirmed case of COVID-19. If person B has contact with person A, they are a close contact, defined as being within six feet of a person displaying symptoms of COVID-19 or someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. Person B would be subject to mandatory quarantine. If it's a proximate case, the D, and the proximate case is they are in an enclosed area such as the classroom for more than six feet. Um, the DOH, which is Department of Health, will decide if they have to quarantine. Again, close contact is defined as being within six feet of a person displaying symptoms or testing positive for 10 minutes or longer. Close contact quarantine, proximate contact is, is being in the same enclosed environment greater than six feet. And that would be WD, the Westchester Department would have to say if you had to quarantine. Now, person C, which I get a lot of questions about, at least from teachers, is considered a contact of a contact. So that person may have been in contact with someone that has been in contact with someone with COVID-19. Person C is not considered at risk for infection and would not be subject to quarantine unless person B had developed symptoms or tested positive for the virus containing COVID-19. Are these people wearing masks? <laughs> so they have not changed that. Originally it said the masks and six feet and they wouldn't have to, now they're just saying six feet. They're not, the way they, it's not, it's not in the WDOH document like that now. Okay, just a quick update of the New York State guidance. Okay, in designing our comprehensive reopening plan, we work to align it with the documents that came from the state government, particularly the Department of Health. There will be a lot of extra text in the upcoming slides that we pull from the state, but I will point out to you the elements we see represented in our plans, because I've gotten some questions about this. 
So let's begin looking at the difference between what is mandated and what is recommended. You will see among the things mandated is six feet of distance and the requirements of face covering if social distancing is not possible. We are going with the recommended, which is per, uh, we will want face covering with all staff and students as well as mask breaks. Additionally, other recommendations we are moving ahead with is reconfiguring spaces and our appreciating appreciation again to our building leaders. We are also looking at staggering arrival and pickup times and we have eliminated the use of lockers. As you can see, we go above and beyond the state mandates in promoting the health of our community in relation to social distancing and face coverings. New York State document does not prescribe any mandate in regard to gathering, but does issue recommendations. And we are prepared to follow those recommendations to decrease the density on school grounds and use cohorts, just as the CDC recommends, it, it recommends and to the greatest extent that we possibly can. We are also looking at bi-direction, bi uh, at reducing bi-directional foot traffic. So we will have signs in our buildings. We'll have arrows of where and how people can, can walk. In the elementary school, it will be much easier, the cohort. And in the middle school, high school, we are looking at block scheduling to reduce the amount of movement of students. In terms of hygiene, cleaning, and disinfection, you will see we meet all the mandates. However, we are going above and beyond in these areas too. When students return in September, they will see hand sanitizer in all classrooms. Our teachers will be provided with appropriate cleaning and disinfecting materials. We agree that communication is key. In addition to meeting the mandated requirements you see here, we have des designated coordinators to be the main contact in the buildings, as you'll see at, when you um, look at our plan. And I am the COVID-19 safety co coordinator. I feel strongly that as the district leader, that is my role. And I will work closely with building leaders, our school physician, and school health offices. We are also committed to a partnership with the, with the Westchester Department of Health and plan to make decisions in coordination and stay well informed by experts. Again, in the event of positive 19 case, we will communicate to families our plans to close buildings and shift to remote learning. Again, probably for two days, allowing us time to clean the buildings and also to make sure we have a thoughtful response and work with the Department of Health on this contact tracing. There are many mandated and required items under screening for tracking. These will be explored in the following four slides. Among mandated elements in our plan was the health screening, temperature check, and daily questionnaires for staff and periodic questionnaires for students. We encourage families in these weeks leading up to the beginning of school to practice temperature checks in the morning. We will be asking all our individuals coming to campus staff and students to attest to a health questionnaire. This data will not be stored, but will be used to ensure individuals on campus have not knowingly had interaction with individuals diagnosed with COVID-19 or travel to flagged areas and are not presenting symptoms of COVID-19. Individuals who screen positive for exposure or symptoms are not permitted on site. This rec this was, this was recommended and we remind parents of this fact, which we plan to do in many presentations and communications. Our plans speak to the mandated items here. For once an individual develops symptoms during the school day, it is an involved and complicated process, which is why we must underscore to our community, stay home if you are sick. Once learning about a case, it is recommended we restrict social contact and mobility particularly in affected areas in order to avoid closure. As we are a small campus, this may really pose particular challenges. Upon learning of a case, we will work closely with the New York State Department and Westchester Department of Health. Since each school is unique, a clear decision chart will be made. We will make our best decisions and we will make sure that the community is informed. We are mandated to take into consideration issues related to asthma, which we are, which our health offices have been diligent about. 
We also plan to work with local health departments to trace, as we spoke about before. We are remaining aware of the recommendation of the state that quarantine is required when individuals have traveled to flagged area. Again, I am reminding families of that as you're still making your summer plans. In designing our district's comprehensive reopening plan, we work to align it with the documents from the education department. And here are some slides. A document has many elements. Here it is important to note that we were asked by the state to post on our website a living document that is both fluid and flexible. And again, it was recently changed. This allows our district to respond to new trends and new information. As this is subject to change, we will let you know when we update it. The document is posted. It's not a prescription for the fall. It can change as things, as we actually heard from the governor on Friday, but we will keep it up to date. There are a number of chapters in the document posted on our site. It is a comprehensive plan. Knowing how complex a school system is, this is just a foundation upon which we build a successful year. For the purpose of tonight's presentation, we are going to focus on five highlighted he areas here. In Friday's press conference with the governor, we were asked to post information about these specific areas separately from our reopening plan. As such, we will, touch, we will also go over those areas tonight and make the board fully aware of these important reopening elements. Communication and family engagement. As we have discussed, this plan has been informed from feedback and input from various stakeholders, administrators, faculty, staff, students, and parents and guardians, local health department, local health care providers. As previously mentioned, this plan we designed is posted on our website and signage is being placed throughout our buildings right now. We will also continue to communicate with families through text, email, which is through our Blackboard Connect system, our newly designed district's website, and through social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. The plan details how we will communicate protocols, teach new processes, and keep families in the loop. We also ask families to assist us in our communication efforts by reinforcing protocols at home, helping, helping children come to terms with the new routines and norms. As you can see by this section of our document, it is a lengthy part because it's so important. It's about our ability to maintain appropriate social distancing, PPE and face covering, and we make decisions based on data from our local health department. We will have daily questionnaires and temperature checks that parents will fill out, and so will staff, and we will screen all visitors, vendors, and individuals who forgot to complete the survey. Our document goes into great details about face covering, and I will be sending an email out uh, an email blast out to all families about that. We believe that that is one of the most important things that we can do to stop the spread of this virus. As previously mentioned, we are striving for six feet of social distancing. We have repurposed face spaces. We have, and as far as outdoor spaces are concerned, we've heard a lot about that. We have looked into tents, and that was really something that number one was prohibited, prohibitive, and also um, you would need New York State approval. We are providing meals in different locations in Cottle. It'll be in the classrooms, in the middle school, high school, it's in various places. In terms of ventilation, efforts were made, will be made to increase outdoor air. Windows will be open to bring in more fresh air. The facilities department will ensure ventilation systems operate properly and are being controlled as designed. Established HVAC inspection and maintenance protocols will be followed. There will be another shift in thinking related to drop off and pick up, which you will be hearing soon from your schools, and we ask that you comply with those new, new rules. Lastly, our facilities team has really mastered the required cleaning regulations as advised by the CDC and DOH. For example, the custodian in charge of each building will come in before school to ensure there are no issues. After students arrive and are seated in class, the custodians will begin to disinfect all touch points, which are like doorknobs, railings. At 11 a.m., both buildings will have four custodians to start cleaning again. 
At Cottle, the students are eating in the classroom, so the custodians will follow their lunch schedule, cleaning and disinfecting the ro rooms during recess. At the middle school high school, they will be cleaning the three areas where students are having lunch. Bathrooms will be disinfected twice during the day, 10 and 1. There will also be an adjusted schedule during the school day that ensures that bathrooms are not, um, do not have more than one student in at a time. Custodians will be disinfecting touch points and there will be cleaning supplies in all bathrooms. At the end of the day, both buildings will be thoroughly cleaned and disinfected. One thing about our plan is the continuity of learning. Our plan is flexible and responsive. So synchronous instruction, you remember, is live instruction, asynchronous is work that students do that could have a live teacher, but not, not at the moment, not face-to-face -face at the moment. We are planning for elementary students, K to three, to be in school every day. That has taken a great effort on the elementary school's part, and we have used every single bit of the building. On the secondary level, it's been also a great lift by our administration there too. We looked at, um, we are setting up all the chairs right now, and we are ensuring that to the our best extent possible, we can six, um, sit students six feet apart. Again, all students will be wearing masks. In terms of technology and connectivity, thankfully, our district has given every student a device. Um, K-2 did not have regular devices, but we've ordered them. They had shared devices. Um, access points and connectivity, we have increased the bandwidth in our building. Um, we also have done improvements to our technology infrastructure, and we will provide hotspots for families who qualify and need it. Um, we have Mr. Keogh with us now, and we are very excited about his support and his help in training teachers in this new model. Other details of the plan is visitors. In most cases, visitors will not be permitted on site. Events like parent-teacher conferences will have to be shifted to the video conferences. Shared items will be discouraged. We are making attempts to go paperless as much as we can. Because of the intense cleaning regime, we are imposing um, aftercare on the site, as you know, unfortunately, is not going to happen this, uh, during this pandemic. We are working with TASC uh, on alternative locations and procedures, and ECAP also. Our food vendors will continue to ensure compliance with nutrition, and we will provide free and reduced lunch for those who need it. Attendance will be taken regularly, and it will be part, it will, the goal is that all students attend all classes. And we will follow up with students who do not. Students will be graded based on coming to school and doing their work. In terms of special education, our document of polls that our district provides a free appropriate public education consistent with the needs to protect students with disabilities. We are trying to give uh, students with disabilities the education as we have last year and even this summer by having summer school, um, students with disabilities are first and foremost. The same with students who are bilingual English language learners and we are in the process of looking at identification and the regulations and mandates and a new curriculum for them. We have designed a plan grounded in the health and safety of our students, staff, and greater community. At times, we are not in the position to act on all recommendations, but this is so important to us. We are, I believe, at the forefront. I, I know that a lot of districts are, or a lot of parents are recognizing that Tuckahoe has gone above and beyond in trying to figure out the best program for students. When you compare our elementary schools to other elementary schools the same size as us, they have not been able to get in as many students as we have full time. We want to remind the community that we are in this together. Um, we want to thank the teachers, the teachers at the middle school, high school for jumping in to our new block scheduling and all the teachers, really this is new for all of us, to
to be doing a hybrid instruction when students at home are also online. Most of our learning will be synchronous, but there will be some asynchronous days so that teachers can have training, that we can clean the building, and that we also make sure that we are following a curriculum that is meeting the needs of all students. Again, even though we are required to maintain a six foot distance, we believe that in these difficult times, we will emerge stronger and more united. Thank you as always for your partnership. Before I um, pass it around the table, if anybody has any comments or questions, um, I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments just about how appreciative I am, and I'm sure the rest of the board feels the same way um, with the effort that's been put into this. I mean, this is a massive, massive undertaking, um, and um, I, I, I'm just truly impressed with the, with everything you've done, Dr. Goodman, and and your staff, and the teachers, and really everybody. Um, it's just been an amazing effort and the communication um, with, the, with the community has been outstanding. I mean, really, really good. Um, the presentation, obviously, but everything on the website, the Zoom meetings, I mean, just, just outstanding communications um, and just a great, great effort. And I'm, I'm just flawed by how great it's been. And we are ahead of the curve um, with comparing to most districts and that's a, a true testament to, to you and your team and all the effort that's been put in. And I also wanted to thank, if anybody's watching, um, those community members that participated in the, uh, in the, in the um, um, forums or the... Um, um, Committee. Subcommittees. Subcommittees. I don't know why I could not think of the word <laughs> subcommittees. Um, because that's, uh, that was a huge, huge help and we got a lot of good input there. So just wanted to make that comment. Just, just really, really impressive. So with that, I'll open it up to uh, comments and questions about the board. And last time we started at that, and this time we'll start at your end. Laura, you want to start? Any questions? Sure. Or um, and I may have others as we sure. filter yep. through. Um, so can you tell us, so it's two days on, in, like, uh, but the Fridays will be off, right? No? No. So no. I will actually, um, Mr. Keogh, I was, do you want to explain what it's going to look like? Oh, you need a microphone. You can't just. You can go up there. Too. You can go up there. You oh, can help sure. me. Oh. <laughs> You're up. So, um, uh, based on the feedback from families, we heard that um, even if we moved to alternating days, the consistency was really important. So we designed a schedule around having uh, one group in on Tuesdays and Thursdays and then another group in on Wednesdays and Fridays. Uh, Monday, we chose the day, like you had mentioned, Friday as a day that kids wouldn't be here. We chose Monday because it was a day in which there were so many holidays that disproportionately fell on Monday. So we just felt like it was a natural day. Um, and then we divided up the Mondays that were left turned most of them into instructional days and then um, retained a few for asynchronous instruction to allow for teachers to do some training and some collaboration. Additionally, again, that would also, even the asynchronous days would be, again, K3 mm -hmm. is full-time. Five days a week, they're not on the AB schedule, mm -hmm. but they Correct. will have some asynchronous days too. So those Correct. teachers can have that too. Yeah, the A day, B day schedule will be consistent throughout uh, K12. And um, the um, asthma protocols, can you just, like, what for children who may suffer from asthma? So um, in our plan, it says, and in New York State, that not all students, if you have an illness or some reason, you do not have to wear a mask. Um, that will be something that we do want all students to wear masks. And I've done a lot of reading about asthmatics and masks. I'm on like, every single doctor website there is. And um, I'm not a doctor, but many asthmatic kids can wear masks. So we're not, um, but it's something that New York State put in their document. Again, if students <coughs> have some kind of a, uh, a illness or disability that they can't wear masks, um, we will 
certainly honor that. We will have to make accommodations that student may not be um, able to be in the same class. We might, you know, we don't have that much room. Look how much room we have in the library. So we have to be very careful. So if parents have an issue, they should come to us. What we did find this summer, and I think I said this either in one of the Zoom, many Zoom meetings or maybe at a board meeting, that we had special education students um, with um, some with, who were in special classes with lots of different disabilities, including asthma, who were, who were first of all, great and wore their mask all day. I was so proud of them, and, which makes me know that kids can do this. And um, students um, had their mask over their nose and their mouth, and some of them did have asthma, and they were fine. Again, every kid is different, so um, the nurse, they could call the school nurse if they have any questions. Okay, and then um, we're seeing um, in states across the country who have opened, and um, we're seeing that in, in those states there have been, you know, an upt uptick in um, passing along to um, just everybody, the kids, the teachers, the administrators. What, what makes us different? Um, from, from that experience? <coughs> That's a great question. Mm -hmm. And what's really different about us is that our, we are, in Westchester, I think we're 0.9 in terms in of community our spread, much in community spread. So we're not anything, we're like this, this model, and we're nothing like everybody else that's uh, to the west of us uh, and to the south of us. <laughs> Pretty much, you know, the northeast is, is um, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York. We're, we have turned a corner. Our graph is the opposite of everybody's. So if the community spread gets above 9%, then we will do things differently. If we see things in any community that shows that um, we need to go to remote learning, we're ready to do that. But in New York, right now, that's why the governor opened schools, because we are able to open schools. And the reason we didn't open schools to everybody is because of the precautions that are in the uh, plan of six feet apart. But eventually, hopefully, in time, we will, we will have really um, flattened this curve. Pretty much we have right now. So I was reading something that even said, you know, some of the guidance of the symptoms of COVID-19 in a school or a community that doesn't have a high spread, most likely those illnesses aren't even COVID-19 in a community that has a high spread, most likely they are. So we will be looking at the community spread, but here it's very low. And Takaho, I've been watching us too, <coughs> very low. Please have your kids wear masks. And then my next question would probably go over to Therese. So I'm hearing that um, there has been another report come, uh, that has been issued by JAMA, a JAMA, Journal of American Pediatrics or whatever it is, saying that students, children can be asymptomatic and they can pass, they can get sick, they can pass it. So maybe, I don't know if you've heard of that and maybe you can speak to that. Well, everybody can, anybody can be Anybody, but anybody. The, the thought well, was that kids can not, really, it yeah. didn't, if they were little, you know, they less likely to, you know, pass it or less likely to get sick. And now there's, I, I just think there's so much unknown about this virus, so it's sort of like, we're sort of grasping at straws in the dark, trying to see what we can catch and figure it out as we go. So I, I couldn't wait to come so we could talk about that, like if you saw that report and maybe you could speak to that. So one, I think you may be referencing um, one of the reports that suggested that children under five carry a higher viral load mm -hmm. and can potentially pass the virus. Um, when they're asymptomatic. So I think that's more of a child care daycare issue than a school age issue. And that even though the reality is most kids are not gonna be asymptomatic or they're gonna be minimally symptomatic, but they're not, um, if they're, what I don't understand right now, to be honest, about the guidelines, and Dr. Goodman and I have had conversations when we spoke, um, <laughs> at the Health and Wellness Committee is that it doesn't really align with the science, right? So if we're able to, like for instance, I go into the hospital, I wear a mask, I'm not even in an N95, I'm in contact with people, we're not really maintaining social distancing because we can't. Right. Why is that okay? 
you know, and we're not getting sick because they've done, um, at my institution, asymptomatic screening for um, healthcare workers, and it was like a 0.4% of people tested positive for the virus. So I do think it's really hard to tease out the facts versus the fear, but mm -hmm. I've said to everybody, you can't really pass something that you don't have, right? The other thing is that there are also papers coming to show that well, why aren't people becoming more sick or why are people exposed? Like when this pandemic very first happened, when it first started in March, I was directly exposed. And I never got sick and I don't have antibodies and I've been tested multiple times. So why is that? And there's been papers that suggest coronavirus is a family of viruses. It happens to cause the common cold every year. And there are four that circulate regularly within our community. So there's one paper suggests that COVID-19 may be the fifth, and that there may be some people who've been exposed to many coronaviruses that could have some T cell mediation, meaning like not actual antibodies, mm -hmm. but they may have this, and I don't want to use the word natural immunity because none of us are immune to it, but they may not be people that get as sick because their T cells, which are part of your immune response, can fight the virus before it makes you sick. So I think it is an evolving process, but I also think that, uh, like I asked um, Dr. Goodman, I don't understand why you, if you're wearing a mask, why the six feet is so important and why we're, we're focusing so much on that. Because I think ultimately it's really limiting what should be happening and the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is our governing body, mm -hmm. um, is still very steadfast that it should be all kids in school based on review of thousands of papers at this point on an international basis. And I do think that right now we are set up to do very well because we have very low community spread. Mm -hmm. And if everybody participates in what I personally think it's masks and hand washing, which are the most important thing. And if we can do that, I think we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. I also, I mean, are you, did I? Are you no, that's good. I, yeah. I think that that needs to be said. Everyone needs to hear that kind of information. Um, from someone who's it's actually in the health fear, right? It's like it could it's, it's be. I mean, but from but from my perspective, being a black woman, it, you know, that's a real issue because I personally know people who have contracted the virus and subsequently died from complications from the virus. And within my community, we we disproportionately represent that the community of people who suffer the most from contracting this, this, this awful disease. So th it is a big deal. And I think that um, we, ha as a district, we need to be mindful of that because we do have um, a growing, diverse uh, student population. Um, the other concern that I have is, again, I always go back to my teachers. Uh, they're not kids, they're adults. And, and you know, every person, just as you said, well, can be affected. More. Yeah. yeah, and and what does that look like for instruction? You know, them being out, and so there. Are, and and I go to our um, our uh, uh, maintenance uh, crew here that we have. You know, the protocols in place for them. They're doing a lot of cleaning. Are we asking too much of them at this point? Um, so there's just so many different factors, and I hear it out in the community. And I want to make sure that you know every part of our constituency concerns are heard and understood and that there are some some ways in which we can we can deal with that. That's that's yeah. all. I think that's a good point. So I have here universal and ninety five masks, mm -hmm. which I brought for you, Dr. Goodman, this is your gift tonight. And <laughs> <laughs> These are hard to come by. I know. Okay, I had to like, you know, promise you a kid stolen. off. No, I, it wasn't stolen. I asked and it was given. <laughs> anyway, these are universal. So during one of our, sub, was it during the subcommittee meeting? With the whole N95 thing, this is another area where I feel like education is really important. Right. Like there's this N95 craze. I see people coming into my office with them. I'm like, it doesn't even fit right. You're not, N95s are meant, like when I go to a, get privileges at a hospital, I have to go and get what we call fit tested. Yeah. So I'm put under this hood, 
they spray things. I'm wearing all, and there are multiple different kinds of N95 masks. Mm -hmm. And then once they, you can't smell what they're spraying in, under your hood, mm. that's your mask, right? So when this whole outbreak happened, we all know, like, I'm a blue medium or someone sews a duck beak, whatever. So there's all different kinds, but now they have technology that you don't have to be fit tested, and these are universal. Okay. So I, pers I think something the district should look into is having these readily accessible for our maintenance people, for people who are middle-aged or have coexisting you know, mm -hmm. things that could predispose them to becoming sicker than somebody else so that they can wear it and protect themselves. And it'll make them feel better, I think, also. You know, they'll, because if you can wear this and walk into a room with somebody who you know has COVID-19, and I can do a procedure where I'm standing over them, mm -hmm. right, within six mm -hmm. inches of them, never mind six feet, then there's no reason you can't clean a room or teach a class or help a kid or do whatever you have to do, mm -hmm. you know, to get your job done. And um, so anyway, yeah. this is for you. I will <laughs> save that for somebody who Ma needs it now. Well, maybe I'm not middle aged. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm not saying it's for you. I mean it's for you as the person who orders stuff for the school. Oh, I oh, see. Oh, okay. Got yeah. it. Got yeah. It. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I, um, that was very informative. And thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And then the last thing, um, I was speaking to someone who um, they own property in and around New York City. And they shared um, th um, that within their properties that they own, some of the companies that they deal with in cleaning their own buildings offer, so like whoever their cleaning supplies are through, they offer training on how to properly clean using those things that are free. So I just wanted to put that out there. I don't know if that's something that the district can look into because I know this is that's taxing. Our, we are having uh, burdening our our uh, budget. Right. We are part of this is the training. You know, training on even how to put on and take off a mask, how to wash your hands, how to, how to use a, the chemicals mm -hmm. for cleaning. So that is part of how to use and how yeah. to wipe things down. Like there's a yeah. whole pro okay. process and protocol for that. Okay, that's it. Sorry. Okay, I have a couple questions too. So I just wanted to ask for a quick expansion on what exactly a block schedule means. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kia? So it's the schedule that students are familiar with, uh, the eight periods in the day. Uh, but they'll be doubled up, blocked, so to say. So your first period will be two back-to-back -back period ones, um, which means at the end of the day, you'll only have had four courses. Um, so the when we all just got, I'm sorry to interrupt sure. you, schedules when we that. just got our schedules from Power School, right. so it says like that the kids have periods one through eight, so they actually won't have periods one through eight? So they will have those periods, they will appear at different times in the day so that they can be blocked. So if period one is language arts, it's still period one is language arts, but you're going to have two period ones. Um, and you'll get to period two, this is where it gets a little confusing, third period, because again, the time allotment is double. How do you get double. all the, uh, classes in the day? At the end of two days, the two-day cycle, you will have completed all of your classes. Okay. Um, and the point of that is to reduce the transitions during the school day and also to limit the amount of students that you're exposed to in that one day. Um, so in essence, they are 90-minute block periods that the classes are doubled up. So you'll be getting double the subject, um, and then you'll just wait an alternating day to have it again. So just to speak a little bit to block scheduling, it's something that districts really aspire to. You know, when we talk about project-based learning and we talk about, um, you know, Socratic seminar and all contemporary teaching and learning, you really want to work towards block scheduling. Our teachers in the middle school, high school have been very um, flexible, actually in sort of this whirlwind of how, for safety purposes, first and foremost, why we're doing this, because we don't want kids changing, or teachers getting different kids through eight periods of the day. Um, we will be doing training on how to use this effectively. Again, the teacher's not gonna be teaching for 90 minutes. That, nobody wants to hear a teacher or lecture for 90 minutes. 
So we will be working with them on you know, how kids work independently, how kids can do um, other work on their own, have breaks uh, while the teacher helps groups of kids. It will be a process that hopefully is something that we can keep and grow with Again, like by what I said, you know, the silver lining is we're going to emerge stronger. We're certainly getting better with technology. And we will get better at using different kinds of teaching techniques. And, that, and we're lucky to have Mr. Keogh here to help us through that. Wait, I have a question, though. So if they're going to do the block scheduling and it's going to be those, say, first four periods that Tuesday, and then the periods, I guess, six, whatever it's Five through eight. Five through eight <laughs> on Thursday. Um, what happens, what does that look like on the, like say I'm going to school Tuesday, what am I having Wednesday? Am I going to have those four again that I just had or am I going to have the ones? Yes, so it's hard to explain without a visual and it could, probably could be its own presentation. Um, but it, what would happen is you would have math for, you know, eight, for 90 minutes um, and then you'd have language arts, social studies, right. science. That would be your four classes lunch would be woven into that. Um, those would be in person. If you happen to be the student on that group, that would have that in person. The next day, all of those classes would be the same classes, but you oh. would get the synchronous experience of being at home, and then the kids that were home would now okay, have that. Okay, that's what I wanted to figure out. Are they always going to have at least one of those classes live? During Correct. Okay. That, and that's how they're, okay. they're um, put back to back. And again, okay. it's, it's a little bit that easier shown on like a map. Um, no, I'm and, glad and kids they're back spoke, to back. That's what I was... Yeah. I was yeah, so in, in some um, cases, you know, a kid who um, is listening to something, they can ask the teacher something in person the next okay. day, um, and that could be part of the, the ways in which they break up the, okay. the time. Okay. Um, so for the middle school, I guess in elementary, all the kids, will there be, like, when we talk about breaks, because obviously this will be different, Will there be outdoor recess for them, and will they be able to get outside and burn off some steam? Yes. Oh, so um, we are. Kids will be able to get recess. They'll be able to have mass breaks when they're outside, socially distanced. Um, so that's all woven into the schedule too. Uh, right now, I think in the elementary school, all, all our specials are outside. Uh, so we are really looking at kids getting as much outside as they can. Okay. Good. What about, um, what's our plan for full reopening, reassessment, and all that? So we are, you know, again, I know what the American Academy of Pediatrics has also stated. I know, because I keep bringing it up. <laughs> I read it, I read it. I know you did. I, and, like, and, you know, that's three feet apart with masks. So right now the state says six feet apart. Again, we can't fit everybody in at that. But ideally, if we can get everybody wearing masks when we go eventually to a to to more kids joining us and everybody in we will have proven that we can do this because the three feet apart is with masks and again like you said the masks are the most important thing summer school was very encouraging with our special education population i know we can do it because it's going to be just the same as putting on your shirt you come to school with a shirt on you come to school with your mask on Mm -hmm. What about when kids are, or if kids have to quarantine for whatever reason, um, are they going to then be able to virtually learn? What's beautiful about our plan and why we like it so much is that because the kids are A and B, either they're in person or not, you still stay with your A cohort. So you could just be with your A cohort online during that time. If a whole class has to quarantine, or we have to, you know, we're never going to say close the school. We're going to say we're going to transition to an online environment. Then everybody's online doing it. So if you're sick and you can and you can be um, part of the class, or if you have to quarantine for whatever reason, you can still get online. There's not two different programs. So our our program pivots very easily to all the three different scenarios. Okay. Well, that's good too. So I um, also commend you, Dr. Goodman and Mr. Keogh and all the administrators, because I know this is a huge job. One of my patients today who lives in Scarsdale told me, our real estate's going to go up because everyone wants to send their kids to Scarsdale. Do you know how many people just registered today? I'm so 
We yeah, how exactly. many people registered today? I think it was, was, I think it was 20 that I have to send kids, the email to. Which yeah. kind of is like... No, she wasn't kidding. She's like, our district's a mess. We have, the kids aren't coming back. One of the surgeons I work with who lives in Westport, he was like, I heard Tuckahoe has K through because he pulled his kids out of public to go to private school because they had, don't have a plan. The kids aren't coming back. He's like, You're, you should sell your house. You get cash. So, <laughs> I, I have going. heard that too because I have heard other moms say that. Um, Tuckahoe is really, you know, and it's our teachers too, their flexibility. And some people even, some districts aren't allowing parents to choose to have their kids online. Right, no, I, you, you really so, have done. And we are giving parents the choice. We know that some parents have, um, they have compromised people in their home. Right. Or they are, for whatever their reasons, uh, anxious about coming back. Some districts are not allowing parents to do that. They have to homeschool on their own. We're keeping that open too. So right, I that along with that. the fact that as board members we haven't gotten right. emails is a huge, huge applause to you, yep. the staff, the administration, because you're really leading by example. So I'm super proud to be part of this. And I'm really, again, the board has been extremely supportive, but I'm really amazed at the number of parents that have gotten on Zoom calls. We've answered hundreds of questions, and they just were such thoughtful questions that um, I think that's why we've come to where we are, because of community involvement. I'm actually done, believe it or not. That's good. Shocking. Lori, you want to ask? Sure. sure. Um, Lori, did you bring a gift? <laughs> no, I did not. Thank you. You should bad. at least text me that, <laughs> making me look bad. I have mints. No. Um, so I, um, I, I'll just echo everybody on, uh, on what, at a great job and really hard work. I know you're working really, really hard, and I, um, and I, and, and, our, and all of us realize that, and we really want to just thank you, and our students, thank you, um, to you and the fact, and to Mr. Keogh and all of the administrators. So thank you. Um, so a couple of questions I have that are a little different. Um, one of the things that um, when Lori mentioned, you know, what we're hearing out in the media, one of the stories that made me think of this question was a school district where a teacher um, felt COVID-like symptoms, was sent home, and then they did the contact trace to 100, it's a big district, so 100 potentially came in contact, and they were quarantined. The teacher actually turned out not to have it. Um, so I guess when, when, we, when we talk about um, contact tracing and lab confirmations, which you brought up. Is our nurse then going to, so let's just say, for example, a student goes home, parents tests, student's positive. Is the um, nurse then going to get the result from the lab be a confirmation, not like, I think my child has COVID. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, so that we don't get these sort of fires, well, right? It is, out. it is, I understand exactly what you're saying. So when a student tests positive, the Westchester County Department is told and they oh, okay. tell us. Okay. So um, we then, and that's why one of the reasons we will close because I'm a little, I think we need time to talk until we get really good at this mm -hmm. to the, the Department of Health and make sure that I, the contact tracing happens in the way we saw what happened with that school over the summer in Westchester mm -hmm. and we just want to make sure, and I know the Department of Health, by, by the way, in Westchester really sent out an incredible document on Monday that really oh, great. was that that undid what I thought was happening on Friday and it was you know where we would have to do the contact tracing they are working with us um, we had we have I have the Commissioner of Health's um, phone number mm -hmm. and she's she always answers the phone but it will be mm -hmm. it'll be a very interesting time because so many things look like COVID-19 mm -hmm. And they will help us also figure out, again, there's the close contact, but there's also the proximate contact. And when we tell her things like everybody, when we tell the contact tracer from DOH that everybody's wearing a mask mm -hmm. and that we were sitting this far apart, you know, we will take their lead on that, mm -hmm. on who mm -hmm. has to be quarantined. Right. And then just on, on, on feedback on that, so um, with the tracing then you have, I saw you had, you had uh, the three, um, the principals and then Mr. Tobin as the monitoring that so the children that have come in contact how, how are we how are we protecting the HIPAA and the privacy of others so yeah. a child gets identified now I have to call the other children in that class and 
I would have to say, did you come in contact with student A? Why wouldn't I have to identify? So the, that? we don't we don't do the contact tracing. Okay. They do the contact tracing. No, so they just the, say you've been exposed. Oh. They say yeah. you've been they exposed. They don't tell you yeah. who it is. Oh. So yeah. we will know who the contact is. And I, you know, they're supposed to ask the contact, but I will also talk to the contact because I'm the COVID-19 coordinator. So I hope that I can. So you would just identify just that cohort, remember. that yes. cohort, which includes the teacher. Which right. includes the teacher, okay. but then again, because we're such a small community, you know, we have to see if the student rode the bus, right. you know, those kinds of things. So hopefully parents okay. will drive their students to school, walk their kids to school if possible, mm -hmm. because that really will start to spiral right. pretty much right. everywhere. But the good right. news is, is this 10 minutes or more. So mm -hmm. it's not when you pass somebody in the hallway, especially because we're all going to be wearing a mask. It's not going to be every single person. Right. And that's why we're also doing the block scheduling, because we, the right. high school and middle school is where it's going to be more difficult, because they do have different classes. But at least we minimized it mm -hmm. to four classes a day instead of eight classes a day. OK, that makes sense. That, that explains it. Thank you. And then I just had a question regarding the teacher. So if the teacher is part of that quarantine, and that teacher who's been doing those classes is now sent home, are they going to be, and they're asymptomatic, but they're just being cautious, right? Are they teaching from home then? Yes, yeah, so that's where we pivot to. So let's say everybody, the class has to go home, or, or we or even have to go home for 48 hours while we're doing this. Okay. The teacher can teach from home. That whole cohort, that is also home. So if we have a live <laughs> distance learning, then we can be home and do it also. And that's where our teachers are so important. And they, they really have been great, because we have and over the summer that they have been Zooming with us and talking to us and helping us develop this plan. But again, right. if the teacher's home quarantined and the class is home quarantined, she doesn't have to take a sick or he doesn't have to take a sick day. They could, and that also is beneficial to them. They could be teaching their class. And the schedule is the same. So if that class started at 9.30, that teacher's live at 9.30 from home and they're at home. We're all at home, but we're live. We're following the schedule. Exactly. Got it. OK, I'm sorry. I have, I have another question. Um, so. Um, teachers, um, hold on a second, cleaning, oh, I just lost my train of thought, um, 10 feet of thought, staggering, oh, you mentioned special ed and then giving the IP, um, or mandated rather, uh, a new <coughs> curriculum, I'm just curious. What no, I didn't know the IP, that was, we were looking at the L's, the English oh, okay. language learners, okay. um, just because they are on the forefront of a, our thoughts with this, we're trying okay. to bring in the ELL students, English language mm -hmm. learners, at least the young ones. In elementary, I think we are bringing in all the special ed and all the else. We're trying. Oh, okay. Again, but with 20 kids moving in today, we just need it to be a little bit slower. <laughs> um, so we're trying to do our best for okay. um, it. That's why we brought them K-3, because we know that it will be hard for them to learn at home. Okay. They need to learn to read. Thank you. And one other thing, two other, just two more things. Ventilation, I was doing some just some reading yeah. and, and, and um, uh, about what some other district and some other um, buildings are doing that are bringing students in. And one of them just was talking about, the, the article was specifically about ventilation, and one of the things that they mentioned um, that was very effective, and they did studies of droplets in the air with fans in the window but facing out, pulling Actually, out. Did you I read that read article? That too. Yeah. I did read that, was, too. I meant to give that to Marty. Only because the elementary windows, do they even open, those ones, and you walk along? Yeah. Do they, do, are they I, able to open? So Marty, oh, they are. Mr. Okay. Um, Danko, went and he went into every single classroom to see if they all had windows. I think they all did, but if they don't, anything that doesn't is getting one of those air purifiers, okay. which would be great if we could get those, but those are very expensive. Right, we had um, some for the construction. Yes, now. and we do have some yeah. classes okay. that have. Them. And this is my last question, <laughs> the temperature checks and the screening questionnaires. So are we not checking as children are coming into the school or are they doing it at home? They are doing it at home. And again, if you saw the New York State document, they, and actually I read the CDC document, they strongly recommend that it's done at home. And I know that there are parents that have concerns about that, and you know, they are, and they are afraid that <coughs> maybe parents won't be doing that. Number one, a fever is not the main symptom in students, in children with, um, with COVID-19. Kids have fevers for other things. But even if you think your neighbor won't do that, they probably, if there was a person that wouldn't do that, would give the kids some fever-reducing medication anyway when they came to school if they didn't want to share that. They don't want kids, they don't want the bottleneck of kids, and they don't want kids coming to the bus, and they don't want kids next to each other, and they want communities to take, um, again, we're in it together. I'm going to write something, um, a pledge for parents, 
And it's a civic responsibility. It is. It's yeah. a, it is, honestly. Like, I think that that's something we should weave into our curriculum. Like, it's not about us, our person, our agenda. It's about our community. Right. Mm -hmm. And we need to get that out there. And um, we're going to be educating that's on that. Right. Not only questions. on washing your hands, but <laughs> why we wear a mask. And how for young kids, I said this on one of the schools, on one of the Zoom calls, we can explain that this is kindness. We're keeping our germs to ourselves, and you're keeping your germs to yourselves because we're caring about each other. And for the middle school, high school, they could understand an older elementary, the science around mm -hmm. it, and how we can really help our neighbors and help our community and help the world if we wear a mask and practice the hand washing and the social distancing. Uh, Dr. Goodman, on that note, um, so in some places, um, um, some people feel that wearing the mask is an infringement upon their own personal freedom. So do we have a policy in place, no matter what, if your kid comes to school, yes. they have to wear the mask? That's our policy. It, okay. it was recommended by New York State, not mandated, but it is mandated. We took that as a mandate that everybody has to wear a mask. K through 12, okay. and you. all staff, and everybody who comes in our building. If they, um, again, it's about maintaining social distancing, but in our classrooms, because we have so many people there, everybody will have to wear a mask in the classrooms and in the hallways. I have one last question, sorry. Oh, last one. Um, the uh, students at home, so uh, just, just from the experience that we've had, and again, we're making it better and better, and we're working on improving it. The students at home, one of the things that were in the plan that I read, it said attendance will be monitored by administration and guidance. Um, one of my concerns about the children at home, when watching my own children, is that, you know, they get on, are they really listening, are they participating? Now, there will be some parents or some people fortunate to maybe have an adult at home or an adult in the room, but as kids get older, they're up in their room, they're in the basement. And so, so I guess my question is, I know we're monitoring attendance, but are we also training or, or at least implementing with the teachers that the student has to stay on the camera, mm -hmm. you know, interacts. A lot of times, exactly. you know, the kids quickly come on, they come off, and then well, I don't so know, are they there? The thing is, there? what we are going to do in our training is that, you know, even when you're on a Zoom call, if you turn off the camera, you're not paying as much attention because you turned it off because you're doing something else. So we want all kids to be on camera. Um, if there's an issue why like kids can't, we will find out what that issue is. But the goal and what the teachers will want is all kids on camera. Secondly, it'll be easier to monitor 12 kids on camera with 12 kids in front of you, where you know they're in front of you, than when we had like, you know, 24 kids mm -hmm. the call over the, the call. Right. So I would imagine the teacher would have them up on the yeah. screen, they check in just like yes. the other kids in front of them, and then they stay there. Right. <laughs> as simple as that sounds, it's, it's a big difference for somebody at home who you know, has the potential to turn off the camera and do something else, yeah. Thank you, okay. I'm done, so. Well, well there's hardly any questions left, but uh, I have some. Uh, no, one, to, a, a f fantastic job. I mean, in going through this myself, it's like such a huge undertaking and really impressed. Because in the city, we haven't gotten much direction, so it's, uh, we're having a hard time. So I kind of wish I was with you guys. Um, but I did have a couple of questions. And I guess with the, when they're at home, are other kids seeing them also on the, the so Zoom thing? Right or is it now, just? We didn't get that. Uh, you know, we would have to. You could take that. Sure. You're saying, like, would like there the, be a the screen? students who are at home, 12 who are going to be on the Zoom, sort of Zooming in. Do the kids who are live see them, or is it just the teacher? It, it would be just the teacher okay. um, for a couple of reasons. One, for privacy reasons. No, that, that's what I was... The other one's, like, the technology right. reason. We want to see if we can, like, okay. you know, just keep oh, 12 people sense. on a call as opposed to uh, 24. Sense. Yeah. And then I think you might have mentioned, because I was, I was wondering what is the approximate number of students in each class. Yeah. So well, it sounds like... Yes, but all the classrooms are, are different. Are different right sizes, now, but I'm just, like, a range... Are, what we did, and I think where we were ahead of the curve, is we had a good idea of the schematic and right. how many desks kind of fit, how many chairs and desks can fit in a room. Right. Um, they're all different. You know, some can fit 12, some can fit 10, some can fit 15. 
depending upon where we're using it. We are using every bit of space. Right. So there are classes that could be in the auditorium, that could be in um, the gym. We have classes in the gym. That's the only way we could do this. Because again, right. when you compared us, we have 30 classrooms, let's say, in the elementary school. The, the elementary schools that are bringing in everybody have almost twice as many classes as we do. So when you look at a district and you say, how are they bringing in K-5, you see that they have more classrooms. Right. And that's where I give like the principals the you know the biggest thanks because they really figured it out. Right. And again, the teachers were being so flexible because there's no more you know classroom and they don't none of their stuff is in their classroom. We emptied right. out everything. We're going to be putting um, we're going to get pods that we're putting um, furniture in. Uh, that will be stored. Uh, we have move. We're going to have to get a moving truck. Like all of this is costing us a lot of money. So we have to realize that. But we're also looking at where our money is going um, and what we're using it for this year. You have no idea. <laughs> but we've also been because we have Lee Lu looking at how much everything costs. We've been um, frugal in finding the best people to do the work for us. Okay, so in regards to materials and things like that, most kids will just be using their own materials that they're bringing, right? No. Yes, okay. when they're not, vir again, we're pushing a lot of virtual experiences, a lot of paperless, uh, but yes, we're, we're, aiming, we're discouraging shared items. Okay, and with the, the virtual and the paperless, are they still gonna offer, because I know that I'm still, I'm still a book person, even though I do the world of virtual too, but the, I'm not a fan of kid being 24-7 on the screen, so I always ask for textbooks home in my house because I want them to use them. I get a lot of pushback, but um, is that still going to be an option so or it's not? we talked about that with our teachers. First of all, a lot of our uh, elementary teachers, we just came off lots of Zoom calls with them yesterday, and kids need to use manipulatives. Um, kids, some ki we, ha we don't have all our textbooks online to begin with. So um, hopefully kids can have their own. If we share devices, we can spray them after. Mm -hmm. um, you could, if you're using something of somebody else's, you use disinfectant after or wash your hands. So there is a way. I mean, we can't get away from um, not, share, not using. So for example, um, teachers have level libraries and we have books for them. A student can take home that book when that student is right. done. In 72 hours, it. that book is OK so, anyway. So there will be some, you know. But will they allow, and middle school, high school, time. they let them bring the textbooks home to keep there. They use them in the class, they have them in the classroom too, but yeah. it's an option for kids to bring the book home and you keep it there the whole year. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know if that well, was, I, I, don't, oh. I don't know, but that's something that. Um, you yeah, we can follow up. I know there was conversation about, um, since there is no lockers um, and then kids have to carry more trying to be thoughtful about um, what we have kids carry back and forth. So. Yeah, no, they don't take it back yeah. and it stays home. Housing it would even be, yeah, yeah definitely. That's, that would be what That's they usually how they do it anyway. Yeah. They don't carry it. Yeah, we can definitely follow up on that. Uh, what was the other one? Okay, another one was, okay, with the, uh, yes, keeping the windows open, the ventilation, I agree with all that, but will they also be running air conditions as well? The reason I ask that is because to wear a mask all day in so we've had some really hot septembers so, so marty um, mr danko is getting something for our air conditioners like some kind of thing that he i don't know like a filter I'm not an hvac person but he did find something that we can i didn't think we could use the air conditioners but he found something where again because that was uh, something i heard from kids that yeah. if we can't but i the, cannot wear a mask in the school because some teachers don't like to put on the air condition and they're already thinking about it like i'm gonna die in that mask well we're gonna give you know teachers and everybody it's gonna have mask breaks but we're also going to suggest that people dress for the weather i mean it's it is you know and also find but you can't wear gaiters now because they're saying they're not as, mm -hmm. as good right they're them. not yeah so find a mask for your kids and for yourself we do have them if you don't have them that is comfortable so when you say dress for the weather, because this has been an issue in the school in the past, does that mean they're going to allow the girls to wear tank tops if it is 1,000 degrees in the classroom? We will talk to our principal about that yeah, because kids are going to have to dress. Well, they could also wear a T-shirt. No, T-shirts too, but they've had kids that they thought weren't appropriate, we'll and then they we'll, we'll talk throw about sweatshirts it. on and I just think sweating. that if a classroom is really warm, we have to keep that in mind. And, yeah. and with the windows open, the classroom could be cold. Mm. Right. 
Um, what was another thing? Oh, with lunch. So it's going to be in different spaces, I understand, but like, is there going to be a lunch menu? Are kids bringing it? How's that working? Okay, so first of all, it's going to be a grab and go lunch. Okay. So there's going to be Do we know what that menu is? Because I'm just thinking ahead of people who put their kids money on the car. going to also bring lunch. Um, again, in the, but they we don't have we're not refrigerating it. Right. We're not microwaving it. We're not putting things next to each other. Parents can't drop off lunch. There's no drop off. Kids can't right. order lunch. So let's say, first of all, I got to the school. I was like pretty shocked. That, oh yeah. That this was happening. I was going to do something about yeah. it anyway. So here it Perfect is. Perfect timing. Um, so kids can't order. We're not having. Anybody Uber. coming from the outside. But will they come out with what the menu's going to be before, like, people who put money on that account? Yeah, Amy, no. if I may, um, I, I actually had a meeting today with our food service director, and kids will be able to, um, there will be a menu. We're going to start very simply to start and offer perhaps three, two to three grab and go lunches that are pre prepared with an entire lunch in the bag. Right. And there'll be two choices, let's say a sandwich. And a clamshell yeah, I guess of chicken that's the nuggets. question, though. Will we know that choice? Yes, we will um, give you that oh, information okay. in advance. It'll be online on the website. Okay. And as we get experience as to how this is working, we will hopefully expand the choices as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And kids will have to, um, we'll get the choices as they come around on carts, right. and then they'll give the uh, person their mm -hmm. ID numbers, and we'll charge them their accounts mm -hmm. after the fact. Very so good. there'll be no touching of anything. They'll just take a bag, and they'll have it at their desk. Okay. Let me see, I think. Oh, the mask. I want to have a question about the mask, and maybe Therese, you can weigh in on this, because I've seen a lot with, I mean, I think it mostly with the little kids, that they, you know, some are using the clear where you could see the actual mouth. Hmm. Have you? Yeah. So. And I actually, um, I know for some of the um, kids I see who do have more significant disabilities and get therapies and stuff year round, especially for um, speech and language. Mm -hmm. um, the speech and language pathologists are using them because you really need to see yes. some, and I'm sure it's the same for phonics and right. so younger this, grades. This and summer, um, for the speech and language therapist, um, they used a face shield. Um, again, because the New York State document does say six feet except when a core activity cannot be done um, you, you, or without the six feet or without the mask. Because you're supposed to have a mask on if you're not six feet, and those kids are also need to be a little closer, so they have worn the visors. We also have gotten, as donations, from two separate places. Therese, you might know what this is, like the whole, full, it's like oh, the mask. Face goes, shields? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. We've gotten face shields from hospitals that teachers can also use. Yeah, no, I was just thinking yeah, more for the little ones. And you can reuse those and just wipe them right, down. Right, and wipe oh, them. But we'll give people their own. So this summer for the... Yeah, but I'm saying the teachers, if they have yeah. one, they can keep reusing it and wipe it down. Miss mm -hmm. uh, Dunn, do you know how many we have? 600. Yeah. Oh, wow. Face shields? Face shields. So every, nice. but every yeah. teacher... We, 300 face shields. Okay, so we had a great donation. I don't know who I, if I could say who it's from yet today. It was a community member because we have such an incredible community that... Um, they they gave that to us, but I'll, I'll ask if they want to be. Are um, you shaming my one and then? <laughs> <laughs> Am I being publicly shamed? Yes, Three hundred and one. Community <laughs> member. <laughs> so okay. teachers will be offered that. This summer, teachers were offered face shields and masks because of the students that they were working right. with. Right. Okay, that's good. Wow, that's a nice donation. We have stuff. such a great community. Yeah. We really do. That's why everybody um, wants to move here. I don't think I have anything you good? else. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. I just have a few. I promise I'll be fast. Um, I just need a little more clarification on the schedule. I, I understand the double periods. Mm -hmm. What I'm a little unclear about is what that cohort is doing the next day from home. Are they doing the, they're watching the same class again? Uh, no. It's going to, because... The instruction's continuous, so on, um, if they start learning about fractions, uh, the lesson will pick up the next day, but it will be done synchronously, synchronously. So you'll be seeing part two of the lesson right. from home. Okay. So, but you'll have double the math, which is great for some kids, but you know, it's, it, they'll have a break from math the next two days that follow, and that's when they'll have the next 
four classes that they didn't have right. the day prior. Got it. Or the okay. pair of days prior. So everybody gets one live and one home distance of the same. Correct, and they'll be back to back. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I understand now. So cohort A is in is in is in school Tuesday. Yep. They're taking math period one double. Yep. The next day, same cohort. Yep. Is now doing math again for the first two periods with the same people. Correct. From home. Yes. So lessons continuing on. Correct, and then the reciprocal for the group that was home, they'll have it in person. I got it. Okay. It may actually be more effective. Yeah, and I, and I think you I mentioned before, Mr. Yeah. Goodman, I think, I think this is a good segue into the talks that we've been having about project trying to get more into project-based learning, because the idea of having a lo longer block of instruction where right. the, the student gets the instruction and then is able to do exercises and projects, and I think, mm -hmm. it's, the, I think it's the way to go, so that's good. That's really good. Um, the, if the uh, rate of spread increases, the 9%, who is the authority on that? Is it, is it DOH? Like who, who is the, the, okay. the body that's going to tell us that that's happening? I think when it's over 9%, that's going to be, you know, DOH. It's going to be DOH. But if, if we see a community spread on our own, like if you recall last March when, you know, we were told we couldn't, we were fortunately in the zone, and I think that's why possibly we didn't have such a bad spread here. We closed with, with New Rochelle. But there were school districts that were like waiting for somebody to say, and some on their own just closed. I believe that as a superintendent, I'm able to do that too. Okay. And that'd be something we would talk as a board. So you if can we make your started, own call on that. If we started seeing a spread in our community, let's say, or in a neighboring community, or we started, you know, they, nobody said anything yet. From what I read on the Westchester DOH document, that we can make that call. But I think once it's over 9%, which is what the governor said, um, that's going to be over a certain so number I, of days. Yeah, so, so I, that's, that's, I guess that's, that's my question because the governor is putting it as a mandate. So what is the governor going by in terms of who is the authority on that spread count? Is it, is it DOH? So every day there's a spread count. I've been watching it. Are you we, watching it? Yeah, every day. Every day. And then the, by there's... By region. Yes, by yeah. Westchester. And you see how many were tested and how many tested positive. Well, who's so, putting those numbers and, out? Who's that coming from? That has to be coming from the Department of Health, because yeah, they're the ones who are getting... That's, yeah, I'm yeah, just curious as to who, like, who our authority website. is on that, who's yeah. telling us yeah. that that's the, the rate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is quite an amazing rate when you look at it. Like, every day, I'm, I'm fixated on it. It's a, it's a favorite. And we are doing really great. Yeah. And when and when you, when I go around where I live, the city I live in, and New York City, people are wearing masks. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify also, the, so to Therese's point before, we don't have the option of bringing everybody back with masks, or do we? In other words, the, the, the mandated from the state is that we have to have six feet. Right. And I, regardless of wearing masks. I tried to, I, I did ask a lot of people about this because, you know, again, I understand it from every point of view, but it does say six feet and we are striving for six feet right but because we're wearing the mask too i feel like we have the double strength no, I got it. and again i think if we go to three feet like the american academy of pediatrics says i don't think our teachers will be as scared because that's when mask wearing becomes that's part of their mandate too so mm -hmm. right now it's six feet we can't bring everybody in not everybody's, not all our students are comfortable. Some of them have other situations. But I think in time, if we continue on this way in New York, I think that we could really see ourselves being back. Right, right. But I guess my, my point is that is we don't have the discretion right now to, no. do, to, to no, go within that 60. No, because that's why I did that. Was the mandated? Right, it's the mandated part, yeah. Right. I guess well, so also, the clarity is. looked at like Cuomo's reopening and um, the plans that were submitted, right? It was like 729 schools. Yeah. 150 something had submitted plans a couple weeks back and he sent back half saying that they didn't meet guidelines or they needed to be So it's being enforced. The six feet is what they're looking for. What, yeah, I, I didn't really You don't know why yet. it was sent back, but that's yeah. Yeah, okay. but that was what the article had said. Okay. Um, and then my next question is with regard to the technology piece and the of, of, the, of the distance learning, the remote learning. Um, what, what are you doing, what are we doing to ensure that the quality of it is gonna be good in terms of the streaming quality? I, I know, I'm not talking about connectivity, I know we, that's a different issue, but 
have we run any tests to make sure that um, it's going to look good to, to the student at home and it's going to be good quality and they're going to be able to hear, be able to see? Are we doing any of that? Uh, in many ways, a lot of the instruction will look a lot like the way we're running our meetings, which is 12 Zoom tiles and people in different rooms. Right. Uh, so we've had some personal experiences. Uh, we've modeled it with um, Dr. Linhan during some uh, demo lessons okay. where teachers play the role of students in class and students at home. And we've learned some of the, the quirks that I think will also be uncovered in the first few weeks of school. Um, okay. Well, that's corrected. great to hear. I, I know it seems like it's common sense, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that you guys are actually doing demos on it and we're not just waiting to day one to see how well it's working. But Correct. You're yes. actually demoing yeah. it and mm -hmm. you guys are testing it out and seeing good. Correct. And even we then also, we're still, yeah. Um, ordered all teachers' microphones, like you saw when right. you were in my office, like, right. Right. so right. that they can move around and people can hear them. We yes. have document cam cameras also. Yes, we purchased document cameras. Uh, we've increased bandwidth um, to be consistent with recommendations. Perfect. And we we're coming up with some best practices. Sorry? We went over recommendations. We did go over recommendation, yeah. Okay. Just a clarification on the K through three full timers. I, I know in your survey, um, they do have the option, those parents have the options of keeping their kids home. Mm -hmm. but what does that look like for those children? Are they, are they getting distance learning? With, when they do, or is it basically a homeschool situation? In that, in that well, scenario? we're offering, we're not have, unless people want to, they can homeschool. Because right. that is part but of the state. Drop? Excuse me? If you choose to homeschool your kid, don't you have to withdraw? You have to um, go it's through. A lot of work. You have, you're not really. Withdrawing. It's a lot of work. You have to go. We have to prove your yeah. your homeschool um, in, individual yeah. home yeah. instruction mm -hmm. plan. So you uh, can't just homeschool yeah, your kids. Not that you easy. have to in New York State. You have to be approved by us. Mm -hmm. It's out of um, Ms. Keo's office, actually. Yes. So there are some kids. And some parents that want to homeschool their kids, very few. Most of them are very happy that they have another option. So the K to three students would go online. Um, Mr. Um, Marash right now is looking at exactly how that will look like. K three is a little different than right. everybody else. So the remote learning, uh, but they will option, be have a real teacher. Remote learning be, option is. is, is is uh, there for the K through three? A full time remote, remote learning option is there for K to three, and there are some parents that are, you know, asking for right. that. Right now, do those parents have the option of creating their own hybrid or no? No. So it's one of the we, other. We looked Either at you're it. You're remote or you're in. Exactly. That was just way right. too much for. No, no, our I understand. Teachers I'm just, yeah, I just want we had a couple of people that, yeah. that was mm -hmm. seeing if they could do that. But we said no. We decided, we looked at it from every way because we do want to hear what people have to say. And, um, I had a question, better. though, about the, the remote at home, the days that they are home watching. When they do, because obviously if it's a block schedule and teachers not up there teaching the whole time now, when they're doing some of those, like, group things or working with their friends in class, I don't, well, actually, I don't know they if they'll really be doing that, their how friends. they'll work with them. Oh, how are we engaging those other kids? So that's where um, some of the technology pieces actually might come um, into play as far as making those connections. So you might ask your class to uh, pair and share, but you really can't sidle your desk up next to the right. kid. Uh, you have to keep the six feet. So you might open up your laptop and, and Zoom with a kid that's at home. Um, we can create breakout rooms in Zoom so okay. the teacher can assign groups that way. Uh, we're going to play around with some of the different configurations. No, I like the idea of someone in class with someone at home. Yeah. That, I like that. We like that too. This yeah. idea of like working on like a continual project um, right. throughout those days. And also with the, um, the block schedule, uh, there's these opportunities to create different types of learning experiences within that block of time. So y teachers are more uh, able to try, you know, 30 minute block of time for working together with someone at home and then trying maybe a lab activity, then doing a demonstration. There's a lot of flexibility in uh, the delivery of instruction during a block schedule. So we're gonna we're gonna be doing staff development on it, so I yeah. don't so. want to over uh, promise right now. But that's yeah, no, I would imagine to. there's gonna it be, might a, be a lot of that. I'm yeah. giving you work to do now. Everybody do these three problems. Right. The kids at home will have the little, you know, just like on Zoom, they could say, I need help on this, and the teacher can help that kid while these other kids are here. So it will be interactive. What, so then they will be responding to, exactly to the chat. Okay. Yeah. That's now, what, what, about, what about testing? Is there going to be traditional testing? And if so, how do you do that with the two? Because some people, 
they test from home or all others taking the test in the class, I don't think that's going to work too well. So, or is there just going to be projects that are going to be created? Well, maybe, maybe that's something you're still working through. We're still working on it, but yeah. remember, um, people are in school every other day, so there is right. way to give you know, yeah. tasks and, and just right. work with your kids at home, and then the next day they come in. But you're going to have to have two different. Yeah, tests. but you know, you know, it's going to have there. two different tests. <laughs> exactly. I know that right yeah, away. Right, right. Right. And maybe it'll be more project based. Yeah, there's an honor code okay. with a mask. There'll be honor codes with taking tests. Yeah. So uh, a lot of uh, civic engagement and civic responsibility. <laughs> yeah. uh, I only have two more. Almost done. Um, any update at all on extracurriculars and sports? Anything? Oh, any determination made on that yet? Or? Uh, not yet. Uh, yeah. um, you know, we're having a little problem, I, just to be transparent, with doing um, our music program in Cottle. We usually do it through BOCES, but we have used up all our time, number one, all our space. And we're not sure how we can schedule it. So that might be the one program that we're asking them right now if they can do it on our asynchronous days or, you know, on Mondays when one kid is off, so we're trying to work with them. That's the one part that is a school program that I'm not sure how they're gonna be able to do next year. Everything else, music, art, gym, is part of kids' days. Some schools are just doing core subjects. We know it's important for everybody. Um, secondly, as far as extracurriculars, we're still looking at that. We have to look at our budget with that also, and, yeah. um, no, and how we would do that. We haven't, we, would, we haven't heard about sports. It's supposed to be a decision mid-September. Um, I think Mr. Tobin, the last time he was here, or maybe was on a Zoom call, presented that they may move fall sports to another time of year right. and do the sports now. That can be done. But we really don't know. We're waiting to hear from them. So what was that one music program that you're saying is in jeopardy? So the... Um, Coddle. The Coddle, Coddle music. We, Coddle I didn't realize, I mean, just new here, that we had, um, actually, we do it through BOCES. So um, we're trying to see if they can do it within our schedule. We have no space for them. So um, like, I mean, both these instructors come here, is that what you're saying? Yeah, okay. did you know that? No, I didn't no. know that. I actually <laughs> so didn't know that. So, Wait, so didn't, you're talking so about the band off, right? Right. You're talking about the strings, yeah. violin. Strings. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So that's not part of the, the band that's on their schedule? That's something different. I'm confused. We're talking no, about coddle. We're talking yeah. about coddle. But if I'm in coddle, right, so all the kids had bands in their schedule, so they would leave at certain times. It. So right. the band no teacher is also functional. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's optional. No right, so like third period, if you had violin. We have no violin. Way to watch them. We have no, but we have no room for them to go. How about, we how have about, used how about outdoors for them? Is that possible? Mm -hmm. What if they worked into after school coming up to the band, up to the room up here, and separating? We're not, and doing, doing, uh, we're not even doing um, task after school. Right. Oh, okay, okay. Um, we could maybe do something virtually during the school day, so we're looking at that. <coughs> but, but it's hard. But Dr. Have, Goodman, if we, if we I, can't I do that this actually, year, um, we're not getting rid of the program. No, absolutely not. It's just like we're not getting rid of task. That's like our first. It's just that this is a very strange year to be able to fit everything um, into a schedule when we have no rooms to put kids. We, we made a commitment to bringing back our young kids, to bringing back students with special needs um, full time because they need it. And we just don't, and even bringing kids every other day, we don't have, we have 30 classrooms, we don't have 80 classrooms. We don't have room for everything. So that was the only thing in the schedule that, um, Ms. Lee and Mr. Morash is talking to them because, first of all, there'd be an adjustment in the price of whatever we do um, in terms of it being virtual, if we can fit that into the schedule and have somewhere where the kids can go. But it will be during school. Mm -hmm. I have another question. So yeah, with the- But it will be different. Can I ask one question? Sure. Could it be virtual after school? It, we are not doing other things virtual after school. That is, that's, that's a that, problem. That's contractual. You, you're now grabbing your teachers after Teacher, school, after, 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 school, after school hours. Sure. Yeah. I would think that yeah. that would be problematic. Yeah. That will set no? up a whole thing that we yeah. are telling them what we think we can do. We're trying to work it out. It's just a very different kind of year. So, so you wouldn't say at this point it's a definite no. You're still working I, through it. We're working through it. But it's it. not looking too good. It, well, it's looking like if we can be flexible, it can be a something. Right. Wait, I have a question about the some of the like Just gym as much as it was. and those things. Are the, are is that only happening in gym when they're in the school, or is that also going to be on the days they're home? 
So okay, I do know that. You know, I was I was we, I was talking to Mr. Tobin about that uh -huh. because we can't bring the cameras or anything outside while the kids are having gym. So the PE teachers will have to make a program for the kids when they're mm -hmm. home. So maybe it'll be you have to do this, 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 fill out, fill out this log, you know, mm -hmm. and then. But like the other, but like the other day. things, they will have some in school of that as well. Oh yeah, because on their other, yeah, day, other day they will okay. have it in school. No, because those ones they don't have every day. That's why I was just trying to figure it out. Like, right, that's right. how are they working that out? Like, are they making sure that one of those days the way right. they scheduled it? Yeah, so, so it's I... a six-day cycle still, right? Oh. Yeah, that's the other thing I wanted to ask. Is it a six-day cycle still or no? Question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also... I, I don't know, but I do know, like, for example, if you're getting math for half the time, you'd get PE for half the time, so it would be a quarter of this. To your point, you would be getting less PE in a week, um, but right. it would be supplemented with the asynchronous. Um, the contact time, like you're describing, yes, would be lessened. No, because I was just wondering if they scheduled it that way. Like they usually, like did they schedule it? Like some, sometimes, like they've had it that it's the consecutive days, and other mm -hmm. times they've had it that it skips a day one, three, five. Mm -hmm. Then, then they would get some in school. But if they scheduled it a different way, they it could affect that. I was just curious. Yeah, I guess we'll I'm, find out. I'm afraid I don't know. Like yeah. home or on a six-day schedule. That's, I believe. Yeah. I don't want to say anything, but I believe it was. I believe that. I don't want to say anything. I think okay. it is. Mm -hmm. That's all I can say is I think it is. And I think that Mr. Linehan did a great job on this. Um, yeah, it's so, so I have no, a, it's very a question on, on that, too. So uh, I'm sitting here t breathing all this in, and I'm confused <laughs> about how all this is going to play out, you know, with the gym and the music and the and this day you want to do this that and the other and i'm what i'm hoping is that if i'm confused and i was a teacher so i'm hoping that there is going to be some clear direction for parents something really laid out so we have so, a real clear uh, schedule and what that looks like and and what it looks like so because during the fall the spring that we had that was a hot mess. You didn't know what day was music, what was what we were doing with the gym. The other thing that I think we should keep in mind is not everybody lives in, with respect to doing gym at home. Not everybody lives in a space where it's conducive to all, full out, you know, some sort of exercise. So we need to make sure that we are we are doing things that take into consideration those people who have limited space for that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you. The other thing is we're going to do a reopening plan part two. So this is like the part one that we had to have all this stuff in it. Right. So we're working on a part two that really explains the nuts and bolts that everybody else cares about. I mean, you care about this too. Sure. But um, a reopening plan that shows you what the day looks like. Right. Um, that walks you. Yeah, through. that'll be. And important. we'll have more Zoom meetings because they've been so great, and they really have been. So will they show that the, the two groups will they? Because that's what every student wants to know. Are you in? How are the group, grouping them, and will, how how will they know who they're with? You know that day. I guess they won't know till they maybe they show up that day. But is it going to be alphabetical? One group A through this, and then. So it's going to be mainly alphabetical because that was the fair way to mm -hmm. do it, and then you know you can't have, you know cohorts of friends, people right. will feel number one left out. Um, people need to know that. And plus, we, we wanted on the bus, students of the same family can sit next to each other. And we also have gotten on our, our, our my emails and also on the survey that people wanted the same schedule for their kids. And that was the easiest way to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so it will be alphabetical, but in some cases maybe not, because kids, again, we have to look at it. Some kids may be, you know, not splitting that way if they're in very similar courses. Right. But it's harder in a small school. It, it's much easier. Well, I was going to say, even with alphabetical, if you have siblings, one class may split up differently than the other. Right. So they could, in fact, oh, I'm M, but yes. in my class I'm in this cohort, yes. and my brother so, is in this. So then you got to push the brother into the other cohort. It's going to be very, yeah. and it's not going to be perfect. And we no. can't do it. It's that L and M and N, and also, let's say kids are taking a lot of the similar courses. They may be grouped differently. Mm -hmm. So the... <laughs> Yeah. The middle school, high school is, especially the high school, is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the elementary was too because of us bringing in K to three, and getting that done. 
So my last question, and it's been mentioned many, many times tonight, yeah. uh, referred to, but do we have any idea how much additional this is costing us? Do, do we have any idea at this point what the additional cost, strain on our budget is going to be? For so I'm keeping track. We actually have a special budget code for all the special things we're buying for COVID-19, um, disinfectants, technology, um, all kinds of other things, personnel needs. We're keeping track of it. It's a running total. I don't know um, at this point in time if it even makes sense to start um, determining whether or not we're over or under budget because there will be some offsetting costs too right. that we're saving money on. Right. But I am keeping track of it and I will report to the board and maybe at the next meeting or soon within that time frame of what it looks like. Okay. Again, and the confusing thing is, you know, when you talk about extracurricular and sports, like, you know, if we end up doing that, then that costs a lot of money. Right. If we don't do that, right. it's a savings. That's a savings, yeah. You know, all of those things we have to look at. And again, you know, we have to make decisions based on our students because we know what's important to them, but also we have to keep the budget in mind. So it's a lot. It's going to be a lot of um, a lot moving of parts. So yeah. So I, I think I think that would be great if you could do that for us, uh, Lee, at some point because I think at the end of the day, when as the school year progresses in the next couple of meetings, when the board is asked to vote for things that cost money, we'd like to know. Yeah, absolutely. How I mean, it is in contrast to the budget and how the budget's looking, which normally we, we don't have to worry about the budget in September, but, right. but we could be accelerating things right now. So We are, but we're hoping that it settles down so that we can have an idea of what we're, we'll be spending for the short term, and then we can look and see as we go through the year if there are unusual needs. We'll be able to track them as they come up. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's are all there I any have. man? Sorry, okay. this is really it. Are there any mandates from the state as to what we have to have... Um, in reserves for PP or any of that sort of stuff, cleaning supplies? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, we've like been going out and month. buying. I'm sorry. We've been, I'm sorry. Do you have an. No, is it like, is it a three month supply or like X number per staff? Have they set guidelines like that? They haven't, but we've been stockpiling based on what we think we'll need and then some because we want to make sure. First, we were concerned about running shortages out there for purchasing. So even before this school year started, at the end of last school year, we started to purchase masks, disinfectants, cleaning supplies. We put in orders for electrostatic sprayers, um, special filters for um, air conditioners and air conditioning units. So we put all those things in, and that's our basic startup costs. And then we, as we start school, we'll track and see how that's being used so we can see and make a determination what we think we'll need through the course of the pandemic and the impact that it'll have on the district. And we'll see some things as we go along because nobody can come to school when they're sick, so we're expecting more substitutes and things right. like that, just for regular illnesses where you might plow, you plow through the day if you have a cough, but you're not going to do that if you have one during this, this time. Dr. Goodman, I have another question. Just It is probably going to be part of that uh, reopening part two because you had mentioned with some of the masks, like the gators, the, are they going to specify so parents know what's acceptable? So um, actually, I'm actually trying wear. to work on the mask email right now oh, okay. because that just came out. Um, I, there's things with that study that they said that maybe, uh, I think any mask is better than no mask because I'm on the doctor's site, so they do say that. But um, we will have, we, I'm going to send out a separate email about okay. masks. We are not allowed to say, in terms of the New York State document right now. In fact, we're some, we don't even have to mandate masks. Right. So it says a face covering is acceptable. Anything that anybody wants to use, a bandana, it gives examples. But we will let people know. Because again, being a good citizen is having a good face mask too. OK. I think that's it. Right. Anybody else? All right, good. So we do have some very, very brief business of the board that we need to get to just two, one item and then one, pers one personnel group of items. So it should be quick. So we'll move on to that. So that is uh, business of the board, adopt the revised 2020-2021 school calendar. Be resolved that the Board of Education of Tuckahoe Union Free School District hereby adopts the revised 2020-2021 school calendar. Do I have a motion? Cynthia, Therese, second. Any comment? This is, um, Dr. Goodman, this is really to line those those um, those uh, days in the front front ends that we have, we can have yeah, professional development. We're front loading the superintendent's conference day because teaching will look different this year. So we put them all at the beginning of the school year. So we have four good days to really work with teachers and give them time to adapt to this new way of teaching. So can you share teaching. what the first day of school would, would be? September 8th. 
after Labor Day. So the changes to this calendar really ought to reflect yes. those PD days in the beginning of the, of the yes. summer. Yes. Okay. All in favor? And then the next item is a personnel. Accept personnel recommendations. Be resolved to accept personnel action items A through P as outlined below. Do I have a motion? Therese? Laura, second? Any comment? All in favor? Okay. Um, last thing I just wanted to ask, and it's not on the agenda, but just a real quick update, if you don't mind. Um, I know we had a little bit of damage um, from the storm on, on Cottle. Do you have any update on that or where, what, what the damage was? And uh, yeah, we had a tree, a, par a portion of a tree fall on the Cottle Auditorium. Um, we had a tree company come in that day and remove it, and then we had some slight um, roof damage that is either finished being repaired or being repaired this week as we speak. It was not that expensive. We will take a look, though, to see whether we get insurance coverage for that as well. It was, uh, I believe, under $2,000, the total cost. Okay, so nothing major? No. no. All right, great. Okay, that's pretty much the end of our meeting. We're actually not going to adjourn. We're going to go back into executive session very briefly for a personnel item that we didn't get to before uh, at the first part of our executive session. So we're going to, we're going to adjourn to executive session. Okay.